axons unleashed. G'day ladies and gentlemen, my name's Robbie, I'm joined with uh, Dave Simpson here and welcome back to 2022 and don't get me wrong, if you're now listening to this podcast and it's 2027 for instance, you probably don't care that it's just uh, January 2022 but yeah, um, Simo, hope you had a good break brother. I did, I'm yeah, really excited to be back at work, um, had a good break over the Christmas period, got some downtime, visit some family and friends and yeah, ready to kick back on. And you and I live both here on the Gold Coast and <laughs> to be fair the weather's been shit. <laughs> it was, it wasn't real flash but uh, some time on the couch was much needed so when uh yeah when um tamara and i my wife both had a, a small bout of, of covid we were sort of stuck at home but it didn't really matter because it was pissing with rain outside anyway so i'm like oh well i can't really do anything so marjorie just chill out here and i actually did my first ever um binge watch of a netflix series oh, so that was good my first ever one that i've got under my belt i'm notorious for bouncing between uh netflix series so it was good to spend some time on the couch as well buddy yep. um simo the reason why we got here you here today and i know you've joined us on lots of other podcasts before but um and if you haven't gone back and listened to dave's podcast about him being the dog handler for uh for sabi it's a, a wonderful story um sabi's now down in the australian war memorial mm. um dave your story about the whole dog thing is brilliant so please go back and listen to that we've got angie weeks um dialing in from live and uninterrupted from the noosa hinterland and angie you um run a charity called ptsd dogs welcome to axons unleashed Hey, Robbie. Hey, Dave. Thanks, guys. Uh, I feel honoured to be here, so thank you. It's yeah, great to great. have you here. Yeah, we're just having a quick little chat off air that um, you said that you have had a chance to listen to some of Axon's podcast before and you said you sort of feel pr pretty comfortable. So, yeah, it's um, it's just a great opportunity we've got to engage. Like we've told Axon's story and we everyone knows about the property stuff, but we're really starting to expand our, our services and who we are and what we're doing. And certainly we had an amazing conversation with Joe Lucino from Soldier On late last year. That was the last podcast we did. He spoke about why people join and getting your head shaved and you know the the hard body soft body and you know when you when you get out of the bubble of the military from a mindset perspective and then try and transition into the civilian world there's so many mental challenges that all of us you know um undertake and you know with simo on one side and me on the other side we've got the better part of 45 years of military experience just between the two of us so as we were saying dave the military never leaves us yeah but certainly in your experience working with some dogs, and I've got a little tiny puppy, I, I, don't, mind, uh, I don't mind sharing this when it, when it comes up. Um, the use of dogs in some way, shape or form to find a connection with somebody that unconditional love has been an absolute saviour for me, and I know I speak for you as well. So, mm. Angie, I know many of our listeners are huge dog and animal lovers, and I know that I uh, really can't wait for you to be able to tell the story of PTSD dogs about who you are, why you why you started, how it all works. Um, and I know certainly if, we, if we've got some time, we'll do some case studies. If not, we'll certainly get you back in in another little while. And we'll, you know, I'd love to bring it to life, I suppose, as far as how, how that all goes. Um, Sounds fantastic. Robbie. Awesome. Um, tell us quickly, and I, I love telling a story because I'm like, how did this sort of come to be? Um I know that Axon has been do – so we have $50 donations from all of our clients go to a veteran charity of their choice after they have their first initial coaching session with myself or one of the other two coaches. And it may it, it, it brought a huge amount of pride to my um, sort of heart and mind there that when people started to nominate PTSD dogs. So you probably just started started to see 50 bucks roll into your bank account from the Axon. Just tell us about when, when Axon first came on your radar. Can you remember? Really? A couple of years ago, actually. Yep. So it's been going on for a bit now, which has been amazing. And apparently how it all started off was one of your uh, participants said, do you know about PTSD Dogs Australia? This is an awesome organisation. And they were the first people to actually suggest that you look us up. Mm, and that was where the connection came from. We spoke to you guys, really felt comfortable, and it was that immediate connection. And I look the fact that we're all military um, is a huge bonus. But more than that, it, it is definitely we all have this very strong connection yes. around our dogs. Yeah, that, and that's and we wanted great. to do that is that um, as opposed to Axon having our five veterans, uh, sorry, our five charities that we support, it's totally in the in the in the the ball of the of the participant as you say one of our clients if they've got a particular affiliation to a certain charity then if they want that 50 bucks to go to them then happy days so yeah it's certainly uh, it, it, we we don't have we have a um we have a completely open yet exhaustive list of any anyone and any anyone can donate to any any charity so yeah that's that's really great that that started 
I do have to admit, I am a little bit biased, and uh, Angie, whenever I do see it come through noted as PST dogs, I do give a little bit of a fist, fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> we and see you guys, and it's just like, oh, that's just amazing. And yeah. I, it's, you know, I feel honoured to be here, mm. but I'm really grateful to be receiving these donations from you guys. And we don't get any government funding. Mm-hmm. We right. purely run off of people's donations. So to have you guys as a contributor it, for us as a const, as a continuity allows us to budget and do those things because we know from history now that we're getting a good amount of money from you every three months and that's coming through and we can budget and rely on those dollars and our number one expense for us at the moment is actually our vet bills yeah. uh, um so it's it a lot of that money goes to that yeah brilliant um it's all about that that patient care like you know it feels like half the country is going through COVID at the moment and no doubt we're all <clears throat> relying on either a telehealth or going to see a pharmacist and getting all of our, the care that we need as, as humans. Um, and no doubt, you know, the dogs need that need that care as well. Let me just pick up on something real quick, which I didn't know. Did you just say we're all ex-military? Have you got a military background? Because I'm just meeting you for the first time. Have you got, are you a veteran as well? I, no, sorry. I No. My husband is right. Air Force veteran. Yes. I defaulted Fort Roger. Roger um, <laughs> I just say us. I just put us all into that. Um, all fall and under I, the military family. You are absolutely right. It's um, yeah. When, whether you're whether you're a spouse or, or a, a, a bona fide veteran yourself, if you know, I mean, h- how many years have you and Roger been together? <clears throat> Thirty. <laughs> <laughs> You just go, oh my gosh, I look at myself now and I go, I'm not, I'm this year marks 50 years, it's my 50th this year and I just think, oh my Lord, I just think, wow, that's really amazing. But it doesn't feel like 30 years of being together and 20, 26 years of marriage this year. So you were 20 years old when you met, when you met young young Roger and yeah, I I turned 50 this year also. So you and I said the 1972 babies. Um, But yeah, what, what an amazing story that is. You know, you are in, uh, unfortunately, or it's the way of the world these days, there's a very small percentile of people that meet so young in age that don't drift apart. And then, you know, for you guys to be still together, uh, as a side note, um, is a a, a great story straight away. It is. And, you know, even you look at the veteran first responder community and pretty much everyone that we work with has been through divorce Mm. um, or are facing that yeah there you go and it is as a partner or as the spouse i i say fuck ptsd fuck (laughs) all of that stuff excuse my french sorry i love it that Um, you swore before i did it's it's incredible very very unusual in these (laughs) these podcasts even daniel was having a laugh over the side (laughs) sorry keep going keep going Um, please do please do it's you've got to be raw and real Mm. And we've had some really fantastic times together, but, oh, my gosh, we've also had those lows of lows. And you don't know what's happening and what's next. And it's that constant um, highs and lows. I'm hypervigilant for Roger because I know I'm always aware of his triggers. Mm. So as a partner, you know, it's so we, we're living this stuff. Mm. And that's really what it's about is being there. So we talk about the veteran family. Well, the veteran family is very much our spouses as well and the children. Mm -hmm. And it's the the grandparents or uh, our parents Mm -hmm. because our network sees it all and experiences our highs and lows as well. So we are very much a family. That's very much when, when I created the image in my mind, well, what would I want? I wanted to be able to create an organisation that felt like home, that felt like family. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think what you've said there, Angie, is is extremely important to recognise. It's not just the the defence member or the the first responder member going through his PTSD or their PTSD on their own. Their family is right there with them as well. They're experiencing almost what they're experiencing or the after effects of it. So... 
recognizing their triggers, being hyper vigilant, as you said, for their triggers. If um, a dog can be introduced to help them in any way, that can ease the burden on the uh, the partners and the, the rest of the family as well. Quite often, they're bearing the brunt of oh. it all. That's that's the yeah, term yeah. that I've sort of used there. Um, <clears throat> it's it's very very true, mate. Because like in another week or so, if I had a still been in. It would be my 32nd year anniversary. So I joined in 1990. Now here we are, 2022, 23rd of January I joined. So um, the team next door are getting some very embarrassing photos of me as a 17 and 18, 19, 20-year-old. They're going to put up and do a little collage that everyone will see soon. Um, tell us about Roger's story then. So when did he join? How many years did he do? Like just paint a bit of a picture of, of the great man that you guys have been together for the you know the better part of 30 years and, and um, you know, what did he do? And then sort of from there, I guess we can sort of start the transition into the, into how, how your amazing yeah. organisation was fined, yeah. Yeah. So Roger had 14 years Air Force. Um, he started more as um, radio, and I'm sorry, I don't know all the tech terms, okay. but radio when did tech, he, basically. When did he join? Oh. Um, Roger, sorry if you're listening, buddy. You will eventually. <laughs> He's not in. He couldn't. He, it was too much for him. Fair enough. He was going to join us, and he just said, "No, sorry, can't do it." It's all good. Do you remember, um, like, did, like his? Because I get the the reason why I ask. If you joined in the eighties versus the joined in the nineties versus joined in the two thousands, they're very, and even now, it's a very different military to what it was then. So I'm just trying to for our for myself and our listeners trying to understand the ilk of when Roger was was serving. So. He's, there's a big difference in Roger and I's age. So there's 18 years between Roger and I. Right. Um, so he was 70s. Um, so we know what? that we're 72 babies. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, serving in that period. And um, so it actually took many, many years for Rog after he left. So he started off doing radio tech and decided that really wasn't for him and found his niche and his passion in photography. Oh, nice. Really. So Just, mm. he loves photography, um, but there are a number of different things that have stayed with him. And unfortunately, Rog didn't pick up the camera for many, many years afterwards. And he's actually just picked up a drone recently. Last year, he decided through therapy. Dave loves yep, his drone. Yep, yep. 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 Oh, my God. Well, he's got a couple now, including a big, mon- <laughs> a big monster of a thing. Good on him. Um, so he's loving his drone work now. So it's just a different run or take on it. So he's quite enjoying that. So Roger was a photographer, um, lots of different things, lots of really great photos. And he loved the technical aspects of different things. And Roger was well known for getting those complex photos and actually being able to work it out. I always say my husband has an incredible brain. Mm, and he good really on you. does. And um, have you seen him evolve with the technology? I know you didn't pick up a camera for a little while, and it would have been like darkroom sort of stuff back in the day for him, no doubt. Yeah. Where you know, and and um, you know, and certainly now it's just everything's but a digital and in the cloud, and you know, post and comment whatever you know, whatever you want. Have you sort of seen him evolve? As as he as he's he, learning to evolve with all of that, right? Okay. So that's something that um, we're working on, or he's working on. So he's got a couple of programs. In fact, this was um, a photo. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, yep. we certainly That's can. Clear. Yeah. Brilliant. But that was a photo that I actually took of Rosie, his PTSD assistance dog, and we'll talk about Rosie later, and Roger, um, down on the North Shore of so Noosa. Um, was that recent? That is recent. He's got a bloody decent, a decent ponytail going there. <laughs> Ruth. He said he'd never cut his hair again. And he, honestly, swear to God, he has not. <laughs> I can see that. Man of his word. <laughs> um, and the beard as well, though I've made him cut the beard off because I just went, enough's enough, come on. <laughs> so anyway, he's um, that picture has been put onto a canvas, but through um, the computer and artworks on the computer, he's taken my photo and then done creative stuff with it. So he's actually really enjoying those sorts of things. So exploring art mediums, Mm. I guess, through the computer now. Um, So no more dark rooms, although he actually misses the dark room. He quite enjoyed that. Yep. Yeah, that's real real photography craft there, isn't it? As opposed to just applying a filter and swiping left and right. And, you know, Simo, I know your photos are always perfect. So I don't know what filter you use, mate, but please pass it my way. But, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, that's, real, that's real craft. You know, when you were saying 1970s, I'm like, that's like SLR and green sort of stuff. You yeah, know, yeah. none of this bloody high-tech high 
um, NVGs and stuff that people have got now. So yeah, that, that's that's hard soldering back then. <laughs> so yeah. It, so um, and look, he's, I think he still enjoys stuff. I've actually said to him, I want him to teach me how to do my dog photos now. So that would be really lovely. So that's something that I, because I love my dogs and I love, I just use my mobile and click, 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 click um, outside playing games or training or whatever and just the silly things that you do with your dogs. And I just, I capture some really gorgeous photos, but I'd love yeah. to be able to get much better at it because if you can get down low with the dogs, which is what I've learned, and I'm always rolling around on the ground with them. No, I'm not drunk. <laughs> people drunk people from the, the outside looking there. in always wonder what's going on. It's it's the same for dog handlers and dog trainers worldwide. If there's always no, someone rolling around. No, when you're being around. a goofball with your dog, it's, yeah. I love it. Yeah. My five-year-old comes out to play. But, yeah, I want to be able to get those photos happening yep. because you can capture so many awesome images with the dogs. Mm. So, yeah, it, it, it's getting both of us together now to, to start actually doing that sort of stuff. So going back to Roger, um, he basically had a number of things happen, which I won't go into. I'll keep that for Rog if he wants to share or not share. Um, but he was also, um, he also has spinal reconstruction and an artificial knee. Um, so he got to the point, he was up in one of the planes and they actually pulled 3G and he was twisted. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So he crushed his spine and unfortunately he could no longer walk. He'd stand up full over. So he's actually had a lot of procedures on his spine so he can stand up now and walk, okay. which is great, and the artificial knee. So it's all stuff to his service and then his PTSD. Um, Roger, because of PTSD, and it, I don't know if many people actually know this because we learnt about it as we've gone through it all, but what we found out is with PTSD and the rigors that that causes and the stresses on the body and the cortisol levels that are impacting our body constantly, there's a hidden factor. And Roger's now been diagnosed with a heart condition and also has seizures. So they're not epileptic seizures, they're disassociative seizures. But for all intents and purposes, they actually look like he's having an epileptic fit, where it's that uncontrollable shaking, he can't speak, um, he just has to write it out. So these are all of the sorts of things that have come about because of Roger's service and all the stuff that he's been through. Um, we were talking about why and how this all came, how PTSD Dogs Australia was created. So being raw and real, guys. Um, You're in the right place, buddy. Go for it. And potentially a trigger for people. So please. Mm. Um, a trigger warning for anyone listening. Yeah. Mm. But being honest with you guys, um, it was 2018. It was February and we were on a road trip on Rogers Harley and we were heading to Tasmania for um, – a Harley rally in, Tass in Tassie and we had been for some years really not living a great space. We had lost our beautiful Samantha, which we called our baby girl. She was in fact a dog with Border Collie cattle and she was 16 and we called her oh, our daughter because no. we were unable to have children. Mm. Uh, um, and without her by our side, both of us were not coping. For Roger, it was much more difficult because she really worked with him for all those years. Dogs are incredible. We all know that. Um, so Roger, actually, on the back of the Harley, we've got our headsets in our helmets and we're just chatting away. And he said, I need to tell you something. Um, we have an agreement in our marriage that no matter how hard, we will always be honest with each other. So no matter how hard that conversation is, honesty is supremacy because we both came from relationships that weren't honest and open. So that was our, one of our key foundations for oh, our marriage. Good advice. Um, so we had that open conversation and we listened and we talked and I swear on my heart, the universe put us in front of every time we stopped for petrol, our accommodation, anybody that we met was either a veteran or a first responder or knew of and they all understood PTSD. They all understood exit strategies or suicide plans. People, And through this conversation and us driving from the Sunshine Coast all the way down to Tassie for this rally, mm. 
being in the rally and then the ride back. Just everybody we met knew about it. And what they all said to us was, I can't get help. Um, I love my dog. I'd love to train my dog. Um, I've lost my dog um, through old age. I, or my marriage is disintegrated and the family and the kids have got the family pet now, but the dog was my saviour. Mm. I'm done. I'm at where you guys are at. And I'd said to Roger, all right, well, we'll just, why don't we do something? I know how to train a dog. I've been training dogs since I was five years of age. I've had dogs of all kinds. All my dogs have been all bar one dog. Um, had been have been rescue dogs, and many of them really badly damaged. And I've rehabilitated and built confident, happy animals. I can do this. I'll just train dogs and give them out to some people on the Sunshine Coast who need them. Honestly, after the ride to Tassie and all the ride wait, all the ride coming back, I went, oh my Lord, this is this is huge. This is way bigger than anything I thought. My eyes were wide open. And I said, we're going to create an organization that will go Australia wide eventually. Fantastic. Uh, um, but we're going to start on the sunny coast, little by little, and help who we can. And that was literally after Roger sharing his exit strategy on the back of the motorbike heading to Tassie to now being, well, May, it was um, May 2018, mm -hmm. the charity was um, created. We got full ACNC status, um, DGR status. So we've registered full charity. Um, it's been a hell of a ride, but that was where it actually started. And it's just grown from there out of pure need. That is a long. That's a long time to be sitting on sitting on a bike, <laughs> like from, from sunny a coast to Tassie. To it's uh, yeah, that's 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 a long ride. Yeah, for sure. Good on you, mate. Any, that's, yeah, a lot of time to strategize. Yeah, and think Sorry. about all this. Yeah, a lot of time to strategize and think about all the stuff that you needed to do and wanted to set up and who you wanted to help. Absolutely, but you know, being on the back of a motorbike, there's nothing like it for those of us who ride. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was saying. It, it just clears the cobwebs out. This is real. I actually always say, I, I, I've, learned, I've been learning how to ride, but I actually don't want to ride. I want to be pillion because for me personally, I love being on the back. There's One, there's a sense of connection with my husband in front and I don't know, maybe it's our bits joining together. <laughs> Being that close connectivity, being there, um, you are one on, on a motorbike and you flow into you, the movement is so nourishing. Um, but I also find that it's such a great place to strategize, to think, to allow me to actually reconnect to the universe and all that, that is actually encompassing me. Mm. And that's amazing. And it's such a good time for Roger and I. Um, so, yeah, so it, it's been an amazing journey. How did, it was amazing to create it on the bike. How did you come up with a name? Who came up with a name? Because it's very apt. It's bit, like it's, it's crystal clear what, it, what you do. <laughs> just it is for some. Mm. Um, it's really amazing. We came up with a couple of different, we were just bandying things around. And then as we met people, we would say, what do you think of this name? And it was just PTSD dogs. And by the end, of, we came up with that fairly quickly because we knew that it was the dogs that were going to really help support. Um, but by the end of our road trip, we knew that it had to be Australia and that's where Australia came from mm. because the need was so great. And we also realised that initially um, the veterans and first responder space was definitely veterans and initially Roger and I just thought we would do just veterans even though we've got friends who are first responders um, we knew that there was a very big difference between the service industry so police fire ambulance and military personnel and then somebody who's a victim of crime a victim of abuse um, a car accident person their PTSD is incredibly different so I, we knew that we needed to keep them separated, which is why we've actually, our constitution says that we are working 
for the health of our veterans and first responders. Um, we have just recently increased it to, we've just changed our constitution to include um, England and America, so our alliances. Wow, so that that's great. We've had so much need and we've always said, I'm sorry, but Australia only. And rightfully so, they say, you know, we've served in wars with you guys alongside you. We are one. And I've always gone, I know, and I so want to help. But our board has actually said that, yes, we would do alliance as well. So that is quite important, but it is always going to stay as veterans and first responders is who we work with. And we want to create that safe environment. And as I said before, the family, you guys know what it's like to be military, the brotherhood, that connection that you get, that's what we're creating for PTSD Dogs Australia as well. So how many people working in the charity at the moment? We have um, 19 volunteers and one paid staff member and she works and it is not me. I've not drawn a cent for the for anything we do. Um, Amazing. I have last year bitten the bullet and I have a marketing and communications lady, Cinder. Good. Um, she was going to be online today, but she's actually having a week with her family. Um, so it's so important. You can have the best business and the best service in the world, but if no one knows about it, <laughs> yep. no one uses and it. So it's a good, it's a good move. As, as a business owner, I, I endorse what, what you just did then. Thank you. It's been a huge decision. It's pretty frightening considering, mm. remembering we don't get any funding from any government or anything else. We have to chase every dollar, um, which is so important to be able to pay her. The next thing I really need to, we're working on this year, is getting administration. I need continuity because our, um, I've just had volunteers and they come and go very quickly because they're people looking for work, Um they, if they've been in the corporate elk, I've had some amazing people come in, but they are goal getters and they then get a, a, um, a better paid job and more responsibility and all that sort of stuff. Yep. So this year is about finding and the money mm. to be able to pay for an administration person to work a couple of days a week to help take some of the load off of me. So as I can actually focus on the fundamentals of the organisation and um, do what I need to do as founder and CEO. Yeah. So have you found that the the demand for your services has actually now dragged you into the vortex? Like you you can't provide the actual services because just there's still all the other admin stuff on the back end that needs to happen as well. So yeah, that's absolutely. Mm, wow. Well, you know what? Absolutely. You know what? At first, you know what CEO stands for. Chief Everything Officer. Oh, <laughs> I just say I wear many hats, including the pooper scooper. <laughs> yep. that, that's everything. It truly is. And I wouldn't, look, I, there are days when I go, oh, my, please, can I take some hats off? Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, I know currently that I, I am definitely the the one with the million pieces in my brain. I know how the jigsaw comes together and how all the pieces of the puzzle come together. I'm really blessed that I've got a very strong board um, backing us and they're helping now. They're starting to really see the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle and see how all the pieces come together. So they're great. I just thought of something. Is the current Royal Commission into um, Mental Health and Suicide Awareness, et cetera, are you hoping that something comes your way on the back end of that, noting the, benef the, the clear benefits of having a connection with an animal and more, more over a dog is, is um, saving people's lives, quite frankly? Yeah, absolutely. And look, we actually had our first meeting back this year, yesterday, and it is on our radar and we've been reaching out to different people already trying to see how do we get in front. So if there's any listeners out there that can help us get in front of the right people to showcase what we're doing and how our PTSD assistance dogs actually change lives and saves, save lives, mm. yeah. we are in boots and all. Yeah. Absolutely. What about you, Dave, just quickly, when did you first come across the PTSD dogs sort of organisation. You, you've how long have you been working with pups for? 
I've, well, pretty much almost from the start of my military career, I joined in 95, um, went to the dogs in 2000, um, and then 16-odd uh, years as a uh, dog handler and trainer um, in the ADF before uh, discharging in, jeez, 2005 or thereabouts. But, um, yeah, I I must have I must 2015. Admit, sorry, t- 2015, yeah. I was going to say, I grabbed you by the collar, didn't I? I said, Pretty come, much. Come yeah. and join the property industry. Yeah. Not, not with Axon back then, but yeah. yeah. yeah you so and I um, when I did actually come up to Brisbane and when I was discharging from the ADF, I was looking at other uh, dog um, groups for myself as well. Um, I can't remember the name of the one that I found, but um, there was a couple of there. I spent a little bit of time with them. Um, and it's hard to like, – I wasn't comfortable with them for one reason or the other, just the way their training methods I didn't quite agree with, so I wasn't um, happy. It was actually causing me more anxiety to be around that um, that particular group. So it is very hard with um, with the, the different charities and all the different um, ESOs out there. Um, but um, I, I think I became aware of PDS Dogs pretty much from 2018 as well. Um, I'm always looking at those sorts of things, so I must have seen something pop up somewhere. But, um, yeah, uh, like I said earlier, I've always been um, very happy whenever I do see someone um, chuck PDSD Dogs on their form there. So, yeah. yeah. What's next? To d- just um, tell us, Angie, so what, what's the main items or projects that PTSD Dogs Australia is working on now then? So really – very much the fundamentals of training dogs mm-hmm. so rescuing dogs so tell, tell us about that know. how does how does all that happen so we're always looking for the the dogs that are suitable so it's actually quite a process we do work with a number of um shelter shelters that are rescuing the dogs a lot of our dogs are actually death row dogs so for example i've just got uh, recently um got willow She's a Labrador cross Sharpe, looks more lab than anything, black lab. Um, so she was in a pound on the Sunshine Coast, believe it or not, but ended up being taken on by Precious Paws. Um, and she had 48 hours to be collected or euthanized. She'd actually been booked for euthanasia. The pound couldn't keep her because they were brimful. And they put out the alerts. So they then took her on. Um, They then, as shelters generally do assessments and all that sort of stuff, and then they put them up for sale. I get alerts from the shelter saying, and I think this is a dog that potentially suitable, really compassionate dog, wants to be by your side, seems to pick up when people are sad, really social friendly, all those sorts of things that we look for. Um, So I then go and actually do an assessment with the dog, that assessment um, generally would take three days um, in its entirety. So it starts off with me just seeing when I arrive, how does the dog respond to me? And I go in with stupid hats on. I might go in with a clown or a jester's hat with the bells and all that sort of stuff on. Dog doesn't know me from a bar of soap and I'm going to it. Is the dog got heckles up and going, what the hell are you? Or is the dog actually quite friendly and curious? Mm. Well, if it's that, I want to know more about that dog. If the dog is aggressive and heckles up and all the rest of it, we couldn't take a dog like that because we need these dogs to be able to take anything out in the environment. So public spaces, anything and everything can be thrown at a dog, literally. Mm. So we need these dogs to be super chilled, super calm, able to calm, be able to handle anything at all that comes their way. Um, So I start the assessment that way. Then I look at, um, does the dog respond to treats? So food, I'll do a couple of different things. And Dave, I'm sure you're going, I can see your head going, yep, yep, yep. I want to see what the dog's drive is and um, how well it'll work for me. Yeah. So we're very much food training orientated. I love using treats. Um, and I'll use a number of different treats with the dog. So it could be a bit of sausage or it could be um, we make our own chicken and sweet potato treats. So I'll give them that and I'll see what the dog really likes and I'll lure the dog around and see if it'll follow my hand. And then I do different things um, using the treat over furniture. Can the dog follow and do those sorts of things? Um, will it really work for food? And then other dogs might just want to work for a toy Mm. and they love the squeaky toy or the ball. So I look at their drives. 
Yeah. That's very, things. very much in line with how we used to recruit our dogs as well. We were fairly lowly funded as well um, when we were sourcing our dogs. So a lot of our dogs, or the vast majority, came from pounds and um, donations as well. Yeah, we'd run through pretty much exactly the same sort of style of uh, temperament assessment for the dogs, looking at their drives to chase the tennis ball was very important for us because we wanted the dog out there searching for 40 minutes or even longer sometimes at a time. So we wanted them to have that drive and then, yeah, a lot of the reward there. It's very, very important. Angie, can you tell us a little bit about the different types of dogs that you train? I understand there's um, a difference between therapy and assistance dogs. Sure. So um, within this sector, an assistance dog, the easy way to understand it is an assistance dog is actually considered a medical aid. So just like a wheelchair, a walking stick, the Zimmer frame, all those sorts of things. They're actually a medical aid. Mm. And with what it means for dogs is that they're actually task driven. So within the PTSD space, what we look for are dogs who are really empathic, number one. But how we utilise that as a task is when our chemicals go up and our cortisol levels go up or our stress hormones go up, it gives off a chemical. Mm. And we train the dog to sense or smell, with their heightened sense of smell, the person's changing chemical. Now, because the dog is so empathic, what we can train the dog to do is come in close, nuzzle as a distraction to help try and bring you back down again when you're feeling stressed, anxiety. Um, And we can even train the dog to touch So pour up. So if you're sitting, often we find a lot of our handlers, when they're getting really anxious, um, they tend to shake. Or the, you know, the restless leg? Mm -hmm. That is so often anxiety (laughs) just coming out. I've had it going underneath you for half an hour. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) I need to send you the dog. You need your dog. You need your dog. Um, Should have a dog. It's it's always on, mate. (laughs) It's always on. So we, particularly when there's a level of that that gets really, I mean, if it's just that, it's not so bad. But when it's really that and you're really, that that tension is really there, then we can train the dog to come in. It's a cue for the dog to come in and do what I would call an over. Um, And overs are very much where the dog is going to come over, put its weight over your legs. And if you consider a big Labrador, 30 kg over Mm. your lap and flopping in, you become very aware, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And this is where we talk about um, as an assistance dog, weight is quite important um, and size is really important for the PTSD realm and having it as a trained assistance dog that can get out and do public space. So assistance dogs are very much task driven. So for PTSD, there is the touch, the distraction, um, the deep pressure, creating space around their person. So someone who's really hypervigilant and they're in a queue and you've got someone coming up behind you, the dog goes in behind and can block or them. even just sits and turns behind. Yeah. These are things that we um, will train specifically for an individual person, mm. depending on what their need is. So some guys go, no, I just want the dog in close and touching me because I've got a sense of safety and my mate is there with me. Others would say, no, nah, I want my dog. If I'm in a queue, I want my dog to have eyes out the back for me and to notify that there is someone coming up behind, just so as I know. So that's a task-driven dog. And these are tasks that we do train for, and they're tr- uh, things that I look for when I actually go out and assess dogs. Um, in terms of, if you look at a therapy dog, a therapy dog in general purpose is just a pet, but a dog that is already probably picking up on a lot of our emotional angst and wants to be with you and just knows, but they're not trained specifically to help a person and don't have public access. Mm, And that's the difference between a therapy dog and an assistance dog. There is confusion, however, because many people do say, oh, my dog's a therapy dog and it knows my angst, it knows when I'm upset and it comes and lays on my lap or cuddles in close. And that's fantastic. In terms of commercial, If you were to look at legislation, 
a therapy dog is actually a dog who is trained to go out in public space. So, for example, you've got reading dogs that go into schools. They're classified as a therapy dog. They're trained to toilet on cue. They're trained very well with manners so they don't be jumping up on people, um, but they are there, they're quiet, they're calm, beautifully behaved animals. Um, for children that is a reading, the, the children are reading to the dog and the dog's just listening. If it was going into a hospital, then they're dogs that are just going to come up and be calm and be patted. So the dog then, in terms of commercial therapy dog usage, it means that a dog is being trained for many people's usage. Yep. So that's the difference. So you've got a home use therapy dog. My dog is just helping me at home. It knows my highs and lows. It's great for my family. That's the therapy dog in a home use environment. In a commercial scenario, a therapy dog is a dog that would be trained to be safe in public space, but is being used or utilised by many people. Sure. Lots, of, lots of pats for that dog. Yep. Pats exactly. from everybody. Yep. And for PTSD Dogs Australia, we have a program called our Animal Assisted Smiles Program. So this is where we take a dog into um, aged care centres where our veterans are. So it's predominantly a, a veteran aged care facility. Um, we also take the dog dogs into police, fire and ambulance stations for on, on the job mental health care. So for example, if there's a critical incidence, they've come back to the station, they're all pretty stressed out, had a really stressful shift, then they can ring us and we can take the dog in. And that way, sorry, someone's just arrived and my naughty crew are barking up four dogs here. Um, Classic. <laughs> so, yeah, so the dog then as a, as a therapy dog is utilised by the, the people in the station or within the aged care facility. And we'll go room to room in an aged care facility and the dogs beautifully behave. They may jump on the bed, get cuddles, pats. Awesome. Mm. So yeah, and they at the end of the day, what are they doing? Unconditional love, mm. comfort. Yeah. We know and we've seen like for example just recently master archie is um the one that we use predominantly for this master archie's a cavoodle beautiful boy really empathic um we go into a nursing home fairly regularly and there is a lady that is actually non-verbal as a general rule and when it took us a couple of months but after a while what we found of visiting we started actually getting little murmurs, just little voice uh, uh, from this lady. And now she actually talks, she doesn't talk to anybody but Master Archie. Oh, lovely. It's true. It's amazing. Great. The power of dog is phenomenal. Yeah. And it just takes training and knowledge on how to, mm. to work with those animals and get the best out of them mm. so as they get the best out of us. Yeah. And they love doing the work as well. Well, they technically, do. they don't even think of it as work. They, that's they're living their best life as a dog. I know, right? And mm. so you do want to find dogs that want to be petted. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And that's part of an assessment, actually. Um, complete stranger patting a dog. How does the dog respond? Oh, I love it. Belly rubs yeah. to a dog that goes, whoa, what are you doing, lady? Yeah, um, yeah so, you, I mean, it is. It's living the best life for these dogs and they, they enjoy what they're doing and it's fun for them. Mm. So, Angie, if um, if I was to see, say I was out and about um, and I saw someone with an assistance dog, what should I know or what should I not do? Go up and pat the dog, feed the dog, talk to the dog, yeah. <laughs> leave the dog alone. It's It literally is a wheelchair or that yeah. Zimmer frame yeah. and you're not going to go and pat the wheelchair and go, gosh, you're a nice-looking wheelchair. Yeah, not going to go um, and grab someone's walking stick and take it off them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And unfortunately, we actually... It is part of the training that we have to give our guys and girls when they get their dog. Um, how do you cope with that? Mm. Because unfortunately... It's a natural reaction. Humans want to go, um, especially if the dog's being quite placid. They're like, yeah. oh, you're a good puppy. But no, you're that's, gorgeous. I really like yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, yeah, so leave the dog alone. Um, interact with the hand. We call them handlers. So that's technically what they're actually called as a handler. Um Speak with the handler, but also be really aware mm. that you don't know what's happening in the mind of that handler. 
they might actually be so stressed out being in that public space, which is actually why they've got a PTSD assistance dog, let's face it, because they don't want to be out in public space. So the dog is actually helping them and doing its job. So for them to actually go and communicate and and start talking to a complete stranger is really hard work for someone. And they might just go, fuck off, mate. Yeah. Yeah. I know my husband, there are days when he just, he will go and do what he has to do. And people want to, because Rosie's such a good looking chick Mm. that they want to interact. They want to know what she does and how she helps. And that's so confronting. It is really confronting. Yeah. So just give them some space, allow them to do their thing. How does one know that the dog's an assistance dog, not just a normal dog? So dogs are normally jacketed. Um, They do have a jacket on them. Look, some of our hairy dogs, so Buddy, who's a Border Collie, a Wheaton Border Collie, is with a young veteran that we have given Buddy to. Um, his coat is so immense. It's just beautiful and it's it's almost regal as it floats through the air. It's just gorgeous. But it does tend to cover up the coat and people often don't see the coat or the jacket. But let's face it, if you're in Woolies or Coles or the oh. IGA, whatever, or in a shopping centre mm. and there's a dog in that centre, it's, it's not, not a pet. That's right. It's not a yeah. pet. Yep. It is an assistance dog. And, yeah, exactly. And people go, out, oh, I didn't know. I, well, you're in a shopping centre. Your dog's not allowed in here. <laughs> so why would mine if it's not an assistance dog? So leave it alone. And the other big thing, one of the biggest things we do find is, you know, we talk about being in a queue and lining up for something and the dog is there. It's probably one of the big times that, people actually come in and go to pat the dog Mm. and you've just stepped into someone's comfort zone and their little bubble. And it's almost like you, you're actually only coming in close, but to you guys or to someone with PTSD, that is like coming in and shoving them Mm. because they feel it to the nth degree. So people I'd love to say to people, please just be super aware if that person's got a dog, whether you know it's a PTSD dog or just a dog for the vision impaired or whatever it is, give them that little bit of space. Come back an extra foot. Mm. It's not going to hurt, but it means a lot to the person with that dog. Mm. And it can be a matter of life-changing situation. Mm. Yeah, great advice. Mm, Great advice, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really – I mean, like I said, it's a very natural reaction. Like if if you've got a dog at home and you see another dog, you want to go and pat it. But I guess it's just that – that um, awareness of if a dog is in a human space, it's at work, it's there for a reason, it's not to be padded, um, and communicate with the handler and just see what the circumstances are. I'm sure there are plenty Absolutely. of handlers that are okay with that, depending on one's circumstances, situation. So, yeah, please. And some days are that. good and some days are bad. It's it yeah. depends on every situation. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. absolutely. And do you want to show your your gorgeous? <laughs> is it a girl or a boy? Uh, he's little Hank, isn't he, is his name? Yeah, there you go, ladies and gents. That's um, that's little Hank there. Hank the tank. <laughs> the little Pomeranian. Pomeranian. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, five years old this year. As Axon turns five years old this year as well. So yeah, he's been a he's been a huge huge help for me. And I guess as a as a pretty um, well known man's man, um, having done eleven years as a special forces officer, I have a little four kilo puppy dog. Um, not as my designated PTSD dog, but I'm telling you, he's, he's been a, an absolute lifesaver for me. Mm. Um, I don't. My, I guess most people are surprised when they see me and my dog and the way that we interact with each other. Um, people have a different perception on what dog Robbie Turner should have, but it does, it's not about the size of the dog; it's the connection I have with him. And, and, and no doubt, you've seen um, many, many awesome connections with people that have you know lots of different. It's almost like it, for me anyway. It doesn't matter about the breed of the dog. It's like what's actually going on, like that that vibe, and the, I think that the the energy and and the the um, heightened sense of smell that you were talking about before. The dog knows straight away when you are not normal, and they will, will react differently if you've got a really great connection with them. And Dave, you would have seen that over your years as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Angie. Um, in general, how long does it actually take to train one of the assistance dogs? Look. Every dog is different, but if you said 18 months Mm -hmm. um, would be fairly standard. Um, The dogs that we get, because they're shelter dogs, we do actually have an age bracket that we like to work within. Mm. So eight months up to three years. 
And the reason for that is because it then does take, say, up to the 18 months, sometimes a little bit longer um, to train one of these dogs fully and have them placed. Mm. And then we want to be able to have a 10-year working life yep. yeah. of that dog. And that's really important because there are actually people don't realise how many hours go into training one of these dogs. So it's actually just over 300 hours of training hours Incredible. that we put in to yeah. one of these dogs from yeah. when we get them to when they're then placed mm. with a veteran or first responder. Yep. So there's a lot of hours. So we really need to have that 10 year working life mm. for the dog. Um, that is pretty critical. The other thing for us, Hank is amazing and, and, Robbie, you've talked about the, the support that he gives you and that unconditional love and he just knows when you're not normal or not right and he's there by your side or with you in close. And that's fantastic. So he's helping you. And there are so many people I'm sure listening that can go, yeah, I know, I've got a chihuahua that is just amazing. Um, fearless little angel, wants to kill the Great Danes and whatever out there, yeah, but for him. me is yep. just my little hero. And that is so true. Um, but I guess within the PTSD assistance dog realm, some of the things that we've learnt over the almost four years, seeing that it was May 2018 mm. that we created the charity, um, I talked about before Master Archie, who's the Cavoodle. So he's all of 13 kilos, gorgeous boy, and I'd actually trained him as a PTSD assistance dog for a female police officer who was medically discharged with PTSD. And the connection was fantastic. Everything was perfect. But what I learned was in public space, unfortunately, Master Archie on travelators, escalators, in lifts, in busy places, just wasn't seen. Mm -hmm. So what we found was that he was not safe in these busy environments mm. um, and in shopping centres, people would often walk straight through him and go, oh, sorry, I didn't see him. Yeah. And, you know, it's the typical person texting on their mobile phone, walking through the shopping centre. They even walk into you and I. So yeah. what hope has a dog got, right? Yeah, exactly. shins, yeah. So that is really important. I, we've created um, a set of rulings around the sizing of dogs, so we want them knee high. We need them to be around that 20 to 30 kg. Um, and then it's also really important that some breeds are much easier. So I actually had a sable coloured, um, she was a, a boxer cross greyhound, but for all intents and purposes, she much, many people thought that she looked like a stappy or that sort of breed. And every time we took Addie into a shopping centre, we were stopped. She was perfect by our side, never interacted with anybody, couldn't give two hoots about anybody but her handler. She was amazing. But security would come and say, what's that dog doing in here? She's got a jacket on, we've got ID on, what's the dog doing in here? Yeah. So again, we just found for our Except handlers that kind of mastiffy looking breed is really hard. And it just kept putting stress levels up. So every time we entered a shopping center to be stopped and asked, yeah, it's like, come on guys. So that's why we like to go with the Labrador breeds, the Kavu, uh, sorry, the Oodle breeds. So the Labradoodles, the Golden Retriever cross poodle breeds, because they're more known and accepted yeah. within that public space, people are more aware that Labradors very much, when you think guide dogs, you think Labradors, yeah? That's their so symbol. Yeah. That's the yeah. little, uh, the, the plastic thing with the hole in the head that you put the you put your, <laughs> your coins in. The money slot, yeah. <laughs> so we've had, to un we've had to conform, unfortunately, and I don't like that because I think that it's more about the dog's ability um, and connection than it is actually about their, necessarily their breed. But size is important. We do need them to have their own um, self-confidence. They need to own a space yep. so that when they're out in public space, they're actually safe, they're there, they own their space and they're able to support their handler. Mm. Um, 
they can create space because they're much more seen if they're a Labrador or that that minimum knee height. Thirty They've got kg. that presence, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Now, when, when you say quickly knee height, is it head or shoulder? Sh- yeah, shoulder. Thanks. That's no, similar. it's the shoulder. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Yep. Um, and then weight wise, we use that as the weight distribution. So um, deep pressure therapy. So if you consider your little four kg on your chest. When you're really anxious versus, say, that 20 to 30 kg doing what we call a bear hug and down over um, your body, there's a huge difference. Of course. And we we know scientifically that that extra weight is actually much more, has a greater ability in grounding a person. Mm. So um, there's a lot of research around weighted blankets. I was going to say that I have seen um, the studies and the, the talk about the weighted blankets, so it's very relevant to the dogs as well. It absolutely is. And that's why now we go with those bigger dogs, that 20 to 30 kg. Yeah, that makes then, sense. Then, did you know, if you got, start going over that, I'm going to say upper limit of 35 kg, um, public access becomes a problem. Yeah. Because these dogs are trained for public transport and going into these shopping centres, people actually say, or the um, public transport says, oh, that dog is too big. Mm. If you need to fly with your assistance dog, airlines actually have height and size restrictions as well. And that's really important. And it's actually a safety aspect. Yeah. Can people actually so, fly with the dogs in the cabins? I was going to ask that. Yes, I'm, can. I'm trying to find this photo for you. I'm not being rude, by the way, because <laughs> when you were saying that uh, when when a dog comes and sits on your chest, um, I want to just show you this quickly. Go for it about the airline question, though. Yeah, so that's allowed. Yeah. So absolutely. So when they're certified as a training dog, as a, a PTSD assistance dog, at, remembering if you just say assistance because that means they're task driven. Yep. Then yes, they are. Oh, good. Yeah. But, um. It is easier if you've got GAD certification or um, so guide hearing assistance dog certification, which is something that we are embarking on at the moment. Mm-hmm. So currently we are actually using federal legislation, so the Anti-Discrimination Act, yep. which gives us complete access for our dogs and our humans. So um, you go back through our PTSD Facebook page, you'll see a number of times that Roger and Rosie have been in hospital or in an ambulance and some of our other handlers where they take their dogs in with them. And it's because the dogs are trained. Yep. Um, there are places do- these dogs are still not allowed to go. So if you're in um, a kitchen environment, obviously for food and hygiene, they're not allowed to go into that environment. Um, some hospitals, and it varies, i found, from hospital to hospital. So um, surgical ward, some hospitals have allowed Roger and Rosie to be together. In other hospitals, they've gone, no, it's a surgical ward, therefore considered sterile environment. Um, And this is another factor um, in ambulances. So whenever we need an ambulance, and I train all of our team any of our handlers when they've got their dog, if ever you need to be transported by ambulance, when you ring triple O, we always say, let the operator know that you've got your PTSD assistance dog and the dog does go everywhere with you. And that is really important because you need to also consider that at their end, they might actually have a paramedic that has got allergens to dogs. So we have to be really aware that, yeah, we have needs, but so do these organisations and people. Mm. So we've got to be aware and understanding of all of that. So whenever we ring up and look, we've done so many triple O phone calls for my husband, um, it is part of the routine and we've made that a a standard protocol across the organisation for all our handlers. If you ring triple O, you need to let them know that your PTSD assistance dog will be going with you. Um, There's another visor on that one as well. And that is that um, sometimes, particularly for guys who've got spinal injury or physical injury, if you're going into hospital and you can't toilet your dog on your own, then you can't take your dog to hospital. So in that scenario, um, our team always just phone me and say, I'm off to hospital. 
can we organise for someone to please grab the dog or they'll take the dog with them and then we'll meet them at hospital and then we'll come and grab the dog and the dog will come back with me and I'll take care of their assistance dog. But then we go in and out and I'll just take the dog in because mm. let's face it, you're in hospital, it's a crappy environment, very mm. stressful, you want your dog with you, so we want to take the dog in to you and make sure that you're calm and, and you've got that connection and That's that good. help from your dog again. Very comprehensive. I, I'm I'm blown away. I do want to show you this photo quickly. It's uh, yeah, that's Hank sitting on my, sitting on me a little while ago. I can um, sort of see it. It's not quite focused, oh, but sorry. um, Daniel might sort this out. Uh, yeah, hold yeah, up no, and stop. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's well. <laughs> kind of sat on, sat on my chest, and I hardly didn't even know, didn't even know he was there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, he felt like he had to sort of jump up there and and do something. Um, let's wrap it up here, just in the name of just keeping things reasonably brief. I'm blown away with the amount of information, the diversity of the types of dogs, all the different considerations. Like I am, am I wasn't a dog lover before Hank came into my life, even though my wife tomorrow has got another little puppy called Molly, and she's been and. Well, we've been together for you know better part of 10 years um so i sort of only had hank about half that time but only when you have your own dog like molly's tam's dog which i you know learned to love and care for and and all that sort of stuff and simo you've seen me with molly molly's you know, amazing yeah she's great as well um a lot of the things that you described about some of the really awesome assistance dogs you know calm very um very responsive very clever loves pats from everybody that's molly right um, Hank's not like that at all. He's, he's much more of a he's much more of a, 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 um, a bit of a bit of a crazy bugger. But I'm just blown away with how um, diverse your services are and, and how knowledgeable you are. Like Angie, it's been such a pleasure to have and sit here and listen. And we certainly will have you come back. I'm really keen on like so. That's all the theory behind it all. Mm. What type of dogs do you do? What services do you provide? All the differences. What to do if you see a dog, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I'm really keen on, and I'm sure our listeners are as well, is what does that mean in practicality terms from a case study perspective? So, uh, you know, certainly continue to engage with my team on the back end here and let's have you come and join us in another few weeks or however sort of that works out. Um, and let's get another episode under our belt because I'd love to hear some of the real-time case studies. From a property perspective, sure, we talk about people's ADF housing entitlements and actually Dave takes care of all that for us, but it's the case studies that bring it all to life where people have that penny drop moment. They're like, ah, that's how it all works. All right, cool. Now I can take whatever next steps that are going to suit me. I know there's plenty of people out there right now that have no, not even reached out to PTSD Dogs Australia that will certainly take the next step or put some sort of things in place in their own mind to go, I need to do, I need to do that one day, purely based on some of the words that have come out of, you know, come out of you today, mate. So thank you so much for coming along. Yeah. Angie, just Absolute before pleasure. we do wrap up, if someone does want to provide you some support through donations or um, their time, how do they get in contact with you? Um, you can do the Facebook page, the PTSD Dogs Australia. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a website with links and information. Yep. So they can apply for a dog um, on there. They can do donations. There's volunteering, fostering, mm. all of those sorts of things are things that we need. Um, and it's ptsddogs.org.au. So ptsddogs.org.au is the website. And there's a, it's huge. It's a big website yep. um, with lots of information. So happy for people to go on there. But, hey, if you need to talk and you want to, because often it's just easier to yep. pick up the phone. It's yep. 0488 10 10 26. So 0488 10 10 26. Happy to have a chat with people. Um, currently, I do need to just put a thing in there saying with COVID and our size, we're working within a 150 kilometre radius of um, the Sunshine Coast. So basically currently people who are within sort of heading down to Brisbane Central and as far up as, um, say, Harvey Bay, that's the radius that we're working currently with veterans and first responders um, and giving them their dog. So that is the facility that we're working with at the moment. We know that as time goes on and we grow and get stronger and get all our systems in place, we don't want to do a, uh, what do they call it? A cookie, a cookie cutter system whereby all the systems are in place and we can just duplicate. Yeah. 
yeah. a bit like McDonald's mm. um, franchise. Yeah. Not that we franchise what we're doing because we give our dogs and we're not, yeah, it, it's being a not-for-profit. But that's what we're actually working on is so as we can then roll this out mm. slowly and gradually um, right across Australia but mm. definitely within Queensland at the yeah. moment um, and being there for people. We'll make sure those links and the phone number are just in the text of what you see on uh, on the on the YouTube and the other social media posts, please, Daniel. So yeah, that'll be good. Um, Angie, again, thank you so much. I know you're super busy, mate. You're the chief everything officer, as you described about an hour or so ago. So um, we'll be in touch again real soon. And ladies and gents, watch this space. There's more PTSD dogs case studies coming your way. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, guys. Bye.